Uh, once again, thanks for having me here this morning. Really appreciate it. And a greeting from all of us at Churches of Christ, Vic Taz, uh, and also my wife, Jenny. We have three children, grown-up children, five and a half grandchildren. We've got another one on the way. So that's all very exciting for those of you with grandchildren. You know what that's like. Uh, always a joy, isn't it? Whenever I preach at places like this, um, I do so, I guess, on behalf of Churches of Christ, yes, but I love to preach, and I always ask God, what is it you want me to say before I come to a church? I never preach the same sermon twice at a church I go to. Uh, sometimes I know when people go to visit churches, they might drag out an old sermon and think, oh, that'll do, we'll maybe do that one. I hope not, but maybe that might happen. Uh, God always puts something fresh in my heart, and I've got something for you today. Are you ready to hear something new from God? Uh, something that I believe he's breathed and wants us to hear this morning. I love uh, following through what you've been looking at in your church in recent times. And I love seeing the way God moves in hearts. And quite often there's similarities around churches too, and in yours there's no exception. And you've been studying a series called Sharing God's Heart. Straight away I thought, wow, you must be a special group of people if you understand God's heart, because I think I'm still trying to understand what God's heart really looks like. Have you been giving it some thought about what his heart might look like and how we express that to people around us? Uh, I thought immediately about David in the Bible. It said that David was a man after God's own heart. And he was, wasn't he? He was a wonderful person, a wonderful leader. He was someone that really inspired so many people People as a young boy, God called him, and then he went on to become this mighty king, and yet he blew it big time. He became a liar, an adulterer, a murderer. There's hope for all of us yet, isn't there, when we hear of people like David who still ended up in a situation like that. So what does God's heart look like? I want you just for a minute, turn to the person next to you or around you, and say, what do you reckon? What's God's heart like? Because if we're going to share it, we have to understand something about it, don't we? Now, if you're at home today and you're uh, hopefully you've got someone else in the room with you, ask them, what do you reckon God's heart's like? And how do we share it? I'm going to give you one minute. Can you do that now? Right now, turn to the person next to you, around you, and ask that question. What's God's heart like? All right, another few seconds, just finish off. Now I reckon you've had some brilliant ideas there. Just a couple. Anyone in the room, something that someone else might have said that was a key? What's God's heart like? It's big. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that over there too. Huge. That's right, that whole smorgasbord we heard about in the communion message. Yeah, that's right. Anything else? Soft heart. Beautiful. Yeah, love that. Anyone at home got anything they want to put your hand up? If you've got something at home? We all still awake at home? All good? All right. God's heart, it, it's, it is massive, isn't it? Bigger than we can imagine. A giving heart. Yeah, I like that too. That's good. That's good. I've been looking through some of the scriptures you've been looking at in doing this series. And they all talk about unity, about uh, God's love, about going out as he commands. Now, it might scare you a little bit to think about going out and sharing God's heart with your community. Who's a bit scared about evangelism? Come on, be honest. To go out and start talking about Jesus, it's a hard thing, isn't it? But we can do it in more ways often than just our, our talking. It can be in the way we conduct ourselves, in our attitude, uh, the way we do things. Uh, just a, a slide on the, the screen there shows a big picture, doesn't it, of um, a whole field through of sunflowers. When I was a kid, that was the first thing I ever planted. My parents taught me how to plant sunflowers. And uh, I was amazed at how you grew this uh, little group of sunflowers. They all gathered together. But when you got the individual one, there's a shot there of an individual sunflower. Aren't they amazing things? All those seeds. And my dad taught me you could 
you know, take the seeds out, replant them, and they grow more sunflowers. It was pretty amazing. When we look at life, we see a big picture sometimes, and it's something beautiful and something that looks amazing, but often we need to come aside and look more closely at what God's showing us. And when we talk about something like evangelism, it might look huge to think, how do I get the love of God message out to everybody? Sometimes we need to just focus individually. Who's the person God's leading me to? Who's the one he wants me to go and put my arm around them and encourage them? What's the word I can speak to someone? We can all do that, I'm sure. So there's a big picture and a small picture. You know, the big picture is we're here on earth for, you know, 80 or so years or 100, was 104 years? My goodness, that's pretty unusual. Uh, but we're here for this limited length of time. But the big picture is God, who he just said is huge, holds eternity in his hand. And you and I are here for this little snapshot, aren't we, the time we're here. But it's important that we do things that honour God and share the heart of God with people around us. Is that making sense? I think that, that's one of our jobs, isn't it, while we're here. Um, there's uh, another thing to put on the screen there is, uh, was written by a fellow called Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I'm sure you've heard this before. It's not the destination, it's the journey, he said. Uh, many years ago, um, we, I used to do quite a bit of travelling into Africa. And I don't know if any of you have been to Africa or know much about African people. I love the African people. They're just beautiful. Uh, but they don't know much about um, doing things on time. Uh, we're a bit fixated with time, aren't we, in our world. And I was preaching at a church over there and the night before I'd stayed at a house with a family, a lady that we've been sponsoring over there, very humble little place, and she said, it's okay, Pastor Greg, someone will pick you up in the morning and take you to the church to go and, and preach your sermon. And the sermon was, it was the service was at 10 o'clock. So, of course, I'm ready to go at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, can't wait. It's going to be great, you know. 8 o'clock, 8.30 goes, 9 o'clock goes, 9.30 goes. Finally, this little beaten up old taxi pulled up out the front, and one of the members of the church owned this taxi and he was taking me to the church. Great. We get in and down the road he says, oh, Pastor Greg, uh, we have to get the generator for the church service. They don't have power over there. Uh, we have to go and pick up a generator from someone's house. I look at my watch. Okay, all right, let's go. So we go to this person's house and, of course, he's not ready. We had to go down the back, find the generator. I had to carry the generator out with the guy put in the boot of his taxi. And then the next door neighbour comes over and says, oh, you didn't hear about what's going on in my family. Um, you know, they start to explain. And he said, oh, Pastor Greg, will you pray for this family? Yep, okay, love to pray for this family. And all the time I'm looking at my watch thinking, we're going to be late. I'm preaching at this church service. Prayed for the family. While we're there, some other people from down the road came in to join us for the prayer time and they had their story to bring. One of them had a need. We had to go down to that house and help with that need down at the other house. By then, I'd given up on time. I didn't worry about it anymore. And God was beginning to show me that what was happening on the way to church was maybe even more important than what was going to happen at church. It's hard to get that mindset, isn't it? The destination is not always the main thing. The journey is so important. Our destination, if you know Jesus this morning, you're going to heaven. You're going to spend eternity with God. That beautiful 104 and a half year old lady is spending eternity right now with her Lord and Saviour. And you and I are going to also do that. But the journey that we are on is also really important. Don't miss it. Otherwise, God would have just beamed us straight up as soon as we were saved and taken us to heaven. But he didn't. He's kept us here for reasons. And we're here to share the love of God. And it's so important that we do that in the right way. There's a passage of scripture in Ephesians 5 verse 16, and I chose the amplified version here, where it says, Making the most of your time on earth, recognising and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days 
are filled with evil. Making the most of every day. You know, every morning we wake up, a great prayer to pray is, God, what have you got for me today? And I often say to God, God, here's what I'm planning, here's what I'm thinking, but I'm ready for the interruptions that you might put in my path. God interruptions are good things. That's the first thing I want you to take note of today. The first point is be ready for those on-the-way encounters. Be ready for them. They're everywhere. And as we're asking God, what does your heart look like, I reckon we learn so much from people around us. You know, primarily, where do we learn from? We learn from the Word of God. That's where our teaching is. And we can learn from people like Pastor David and others that teach us so many important and good things. But, you know, I was thinking during the week, we've got a lady in my home church uh, whose name is Rachel, and she's a beautiful lady. She has an intellectual disability and struggles with a lot of life issues. And often during the church service, she'll ask a question. You know how when you're preaching, you ask a rhetorical question? Rachel will answer that rhetorical question for you. Uh, She's one of those ones that interjects a lot. And sometimes I find myself thinking, oh, Rachel, you know, we're trying to get on with this. But she'll come out with an absolute gem. She'll say something and I'll go, wow, God, you've taught me something through that person. We can learn from the most unusual places sometimes. There's a parable I'm sure you're very familiar with in Luke chapter 10, which I'm just going to read for us now. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm sure we know it well. If you're like me, though, whenever you hear scripture, if you're ready, God will show you something different. So as I'm reading it for you this morning, listen to what God might be saying to you. Luke 10, verse 30. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was travelling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbour to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. I wonder this morning... If you were to place yourself in that story, who would you be most like in that story? You might feel like the beaten up person. You might not be travelling that well today and feel pretty beaten up and feel like you need to be cared for. Someone to put an arm around you and have compassion on you. We pray for you this morning if that's you. But you might be like the priest who walked past, or like the temple assistant, who walked past as well. Years ago, I was pastoring a church in Port Arlington, uh, just out of Geelong, and I was driving down to preach my sermon that morning, and I was preaching, would you believe, on the Good Samaritan that morning. And as I was driving along, uh, I had this habit, and I'm going along the car, I don't know what you're like, David, but as I'm driving along, the sermon's in my head, and I'm thinking of some of the things I'm going to say, and Asking God, God, what is it you want to reveal this morning? Very focused, driving down the road. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed this little red car on the side of the road. Didn't think too much of it. Kept driving, got to church, and of course I preached a wonderful sermon, I'm sure, on the Good Samaritan. Afterwards, a lady called Chris came up to me and she said, uh, hey, that was a great message this morning. 
She said, um, you didn't see me this morning, did you? And I said, no, no. And she said, oh, my car broke down on the way down here. And I was standing next to the car when you drove past. How did I feel? I've just preached this wonderful sermon on the Good Samaritan. Boom. I've driven straight past. I was that priest <laughs> who went the other side. Now, I can honestly say I didn't intentionally do that. But still, the point sat very heavily on me. This story Jesus told, he, it was a story. It was a made-up story. It's a parable. But it would have had such an impact. Can you imagine those good Jewish listeners listening to this story? You know, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And when they hear about this poor Jewish man that's been beaten up and he's on the side of the road and he's wounded... They're waiting for the hero of the story. And they would have heard about the priest. This is going to be the hero. Or maybe the temple assistant. It's the Samaritan. A hated, despised person in that community. I can't think of anyone that I can really relate to in our communities that might be hated that much. Maybe Collingwood supporters. Uh, Is there any Collingwood supporters here? Oh dear. Okay, I'll take that back. All right, they're not that hated. We're just jealous, that's all it is, of your success. But this person was a hated person, and Jesus uses that person to be the hero. Didn't Jesus love to stir them up with things like that? He would always find people that had become very high and mighty in their attitudes and cut them down straight away. It was the Samaritan who was the hero. And this Samaritan didn't just, you know, quickly bandage him up and go. It says he anointed him with oil, with wine. He took him to an inn. He gave the innkeeper money and said, please look after this person. He showed something called compassion, that word says, from the word compassio, which which means a deep feeling of love, support, care, compassion. He really genuinely cared. And he was generous. He also said, I want this guy to be looked after properly. He went the extra mile, didn't he? So the second point I'd make this morning is never underestimate people. We can look at sometimes at people, at people groups. I can look at the Rachels of the world. and We can underestimate them. Don't do that. God made everyone equally. None of us are better than one another. He's made us all on the same level. Don't underestimate people. In this case, it was a Samaritan that he used to be the hero of the story. We can learn from so many people. And it might be that as you think about that story today, you might be the beaten up person, you might be the priest, you might be the temple assistant. For me... I had to learn what it meant to stop sometimes. We go at a pretty high pace sometimes in life. We need to stop. God, what is it you're showing me right now? What's that conversation you want me to have? Who do you want me to spend time with? Who can I buy a cup of coffee for? What's a word I can speak? Maybe, and this is scary, maybe God's asking you to go down to a neighbour and just talk to them. You might even get to pray for them. How often do you hear someone in your neighbourhood say things to you like, oh, you know, I'm really sick at the moment or I've got a relative who's really sick and they're in hospital, they're dying, and we go, oh, you poor thing. Sorry to hear that. Wouldn't it be great if we said, you know what, I'm a Christian. I believe in a God who is great and mighty and powerful. Can I pray for you right now? Just a word of prayer. Can I pray for that person that you you're feeling for at the moment. Now, they might look at you pretty strangely. But that can have a powerful effect. That's a way that we can show the heart of God to people around us. Final point this morning is love your neighbour. Jesus had actually asked that question. Before that reading of the Good Samaritan, the whole theme was around this uh, lawyer. Are there any lawyers here this morning? Because lawyers aren't very popular people often, are they? It's a hard thing. Uh, but lawyers aren't that popular. And this guy was trying to trap Jesus out. 
And in the preceding verses leading up to that story of the Good Samaritan, this lawyer stood up and said, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered straight back to him and said, Well, you know, you're the teacher. You're the, you're the smart person in the room. Why don't you tell us? What does the law of Moses say? You see, lawyers back in those days were also experts on religious law. There was no separation between uh, the state and the church. So they knew all these things. So Jesus said, come on, you know the answer. Tell us. What does the law of Moses say? And the man said, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus says, correct. Do this and you will live. And then he went on and answered the question, who is my neighbour? And he gave that parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm wondering this morning, for you to answer that question, who is my neighbour? And right now you might be thinking about a neighbour, a next door neighbour, someone in your neighbourhood. Or you might be thinking about a family member. Maybe you think about someone you work with, a friend. All these are your neighbours. But I know in my life God sometimes brings someone into my mind that I'm thinking about, someone I'm feeling for, someone I'm feeling compassion towards. What would God be asking you to do for that neighbour? I love the way you have things happening in your church where you're feeding people and making meals, providing clothing, doing all those things that you do. That's a way we can show love and compassion. But when we bring it back to that single sunflower type moment, what is it that God's asking you to do? Who's the person he's leading you to? And this morning, I want you to think about what action you're now going to take. It might be something really small, really small. Or it might be something bigger. And don't be overawed by that. God will go with you in whatever you do. Be bold. Go down and knock on their door and say hi. Or maybe it's time to go back to someone that you've fallen out of relationship with. And you need to go back and say, you know what, I'm sorry for my part in that. Can we be friends again? That's showing compassion also. It's hard to do though, isn't it? But we're talking about how do we show God's heart to people around us. That's some ways we can do that. And I think often we've cheapened that whole culture of compassion in our community today. We just say things like, uh, oh, I feel your pain. Sorry to hear that. Without that real deep compassion happening. What's God asking you to do this morning? And you know, Asking God for those moments to, a very dangerous prayer, by the way, to pray, is God, give me an opportunity today to speak to someone about you. I can guarantee you if you pray that prayer, he will answer that prayer. And then it's up to you to do the rest. And ask God for those moments on the way to the supermarket, on the way to your work or wherever you might be travelling, walking down the street, God, bring those people in my path. I'm I'm ready for whatever you might bring. And he will. And you'll get an opportunity to show compassion. So I'm wondering right now, you've got those cards in front of you here this morning, and I know you can do this also online this morning. Can I invite you, please, to have a look at those uh, cards? And I've written some things on there that you might consider about what person, um, you know, do you relate to most? in the, the parable that we had uh, read this morning. Um, who do I need to st- How do I need to stop? How do I need to minister to someone around me? And what action do I need to take? And on the card there, just write down what God might be asking you to do this morning. Online, put something down there, won't you, about what God might be leading you to. 
I think we're going to have some music. Are we? Is it the one we're doing now? Yep, great. Thank you. Just for a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that, and then we'll pick it up from there. Thank you. Thank you.